I, I engage people, the, the first half of the day is talking about stability and trimming. Because a lot of pilots don't understand static and dynamic stability. And they keep moving controls around to try and get the result that they want. When the airplane just needs you to give it what it wants. G'day everyone, welcome to episode 123 of Flight Training Australia. From Darwin here in the top end, this is the podcast all about flight training and flying in Australia and beyond. I'm your host, Trent Robinson. G'day, thanks for joining me. Just got back from a, a, a great night out at the Deck Chair Cinema here in Darwin. Care Flight had a, a great fundraiser event, stunning evening, the stars were out, the cold beers flowing, fruit bats overhead geckos crawling up and down the screen and top gun maverick over the top of it it was uh, really great to catch up with a bunch of new pilots here in the territory old friends at care flight and uh, an old mate from the aero club days who i've been meaning to catch up with for ages he's been here for a while flying with alliance and it's taken my sorry ass time to catch up with him so mark great to see you mate and uh, a successful evening for care flight raising uh, funds to continue to go towards new equipment and upgrades so Thank you to everyone who came and supported the evening and uh, it was great to catch up with everybody. Thank you to everyone for last week. Uh, quite possibly my biggest episode yet. Uh, the reason being I've not received so much uh, online discussion, feedback from emails, messages, um, phone calls, votes of support. It was just huge. Um, emails and messages about schools that are doing fantastic work out there and some that aren't. It is without doubt the yeah, a, a big thing and I'm not going to uh, just stop with that episode. It is something I'm going to continue to be working on and, and pushing for change and education. And like I said, it's not that anyone's necessarily doing anything horrible and malicious, but there are a lot of uh, shortages and a lot of misunderstandings a lot of lack in industry at the moment and it is all fixable. It really is. It's changeable through education. Mostly really doesn't have to cost very much at all to change a, a, a way that uh, schools operate and we will all come out better for it. So thank you to everyone for doing that. It's uh, been amazing and we're going to continue the work with uh, this episode here where uh, there are other things going on right now in industry that are attempting to make change, which uh, brings me to this guest. Uh, Paul runs Strike Aviation and Bad Attitude Advanced Flight Training in Caboolture in Queensland. He runs a mixture of Varios and UPOT or uh, loss of control in flight training. And he's been doing some great work with uh, getting a bunch of operators and people together a few years ago. And it is coming all together now. And he gave me a bit of a call and had a good chat about things and I thought, you know what, we need to talk about this further and it's uh, fitted in really, really well. So following on from that chat and discussion we had last week, I'm uh, joined by special guest Paul Strike. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Trent. Pleasure to be here. So Paul, um, probably quite a few people wouldn't, wouldn't be as familiar with you and your background and where you're from, so do you want to just give us a bit of an intro as to where you are right now and... Uh, your, your interest in flying and, and we'll, we'll move on from there. Yeah, no problem. Uh, my dad was in the army and my first recollection of uh, interest in aviation was going to a Christmas party and Santa Claus arriving at the Christmas party, hanging out the side of a Bell 206 helicopter. And uh, as a nine-year-old kid, that's, that's pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then I, I joined the air cadets did the whole ATC thing, got into uh, the Air Force as a uh, electrical fitter, ended up as an avionics technician, did 16 years in the Air Force. But I learned to fly gliders at the Raffle Avenue Gliding Club in 1985, so last century, uh, and um, did competition flying in some of the hot ships and uh, around Narromine and Forbes. That was really cool. And then I started doing some... Um, uh, powered training at Point Cook Aero Club, which was really cool. Uh, the the history, uh, the the uh, birthplace of military aviation. And then I found ultralights uh, back then, the uh, AUF Australian Ultralight Federation, and uh, got a 
ultralight certificate in sky foxes and learnt to fly a drifter. I got my instructor rating on a drifter 503. You really got to fly those suckers. Uh, just too open and vulnerable to me. <laughs> I can it's imagine fun. it'd be fantastic just having the whole world in front of you. But Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it, such a narrow performance band, you know, like 80 knots V and E and 30 something knots stall. So you don't have a lot of margin for area. But back then, you know, um, we all just got along. We're learning to fly and um, didn't really learn how to land an aeroplane until I got the instructor rating. I sort of just put it in the vicinity of the planet and just let it pop on, right? But then when I got instructor rating, I went, oh, oh that's how you're supposed to do it. And uh, so it's a perpetual learning curve and, and this is – part of the problem is people think you just get a license or a certificate and that's the end of it. It's, it's not. So life got in the way, a couple of children, a divorce, you know, got out of the air force. What am I doing? Where am I going? Um, met a wonderful lady online when I was working in the middle East and she was from Canada and she had a commercial pilot license in Canada and she was going through a divorce. And anyway, we, uh, uh, ended up getting married and I went to work in Canada after I finished in the Middle East and uh, worked for Buffalo Joe at uh, oh wow at uh, Yellowknife. At, so how was that? That was, was it all, was it all uh, theatrics and things or was it... <laughs> uh, no? Well, you know it's TV, right? But um, um, I, I spent a few months there with with uh, Joe and the team, great people. I love Canada. It's a beautiful place. But Yellowknife is a significantly harsh environment, and I'm glad I did it when I was in my 30s and not now because it's just bloody hard work. Uh, and uh, so I spent a bit of time there. I spent four years in Yellowknife, um, and it was a wonderful part of my life. It was great. Then I ended up down yeah. in... Um, Calgary eventually uh, running an avionics shop for uh, Western Canada, Bombardier uh, maintenance uh, shop. And we were working on Dash 8s, um, Twin Otters, Dash 7s, um, CRJs, the 200, 700, 900s, um, and a really interesting environment working with a bunch of contractors and um and just basically uh, learning a whole bunch of stuff about maintenance and modifications and scheduled maintenance and all that sort of stuff and uh we um Karen and I were trying to keep flying at the time um Canada has a different pay scale and stuff I started my first job um out of Buffalo at $15 an hour uh, so it was hard to do any flying on $15 an hour when you're living in Yellowknife, uh, if they had any aeroplanes available. But, you know, you do what you need to do to keep things going. So uh, ended up, <clears throat> my dad and mum got cancer and I said to Karen, how about we go live in my part of the world for a while? So we moved down here and I got a job flying, fly out in PNG, uh, four weeks on, four weeks off. We bought an aeroplane. We bought a little Sky Fox. Keep going back to the, the tailwheel <laughs> and the Sky Fox. Uh, bought it with a, a friend who was the chief pilot of the Dash 8 operations up in PNG. Great pilot. Flew in Vietnam, flying Cessna 180s. Uh, learned so much from him. Um, and then uh, Karen wanted to convert her Canadian CPL to um, the Australian and I said, oh, look, you know, it's a lot of work to get the CPL converted. Why don't you just get the PPL? And she said, no, I've got a CPL and I want to convert the CPL, which is a fair call, you know. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, for the cost and the effort and all that stuff, we really need to have a job to go to to expend that amount of effort and time and money, right? And uh, so I went back to P&G and come back. And then when I come back on a break, she says, there's a Banato operation for sale. So we ended up buying her a job. And so we saw the first, won't be the last. 
Yeah, that's right. We um, we sold our half of the Sky Fox to Ian and bought a decathlon. And and I went, oh, I better get my commercial because I only had a private license at the time. I went, oh, I better get my commercial. Oh, that's why you didn't want her to do it because she'd be better. Well, <laughs> she is better, but um, it was it was like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, the FOMO, right? Fear of missing out, <laughs> you know, get on that train. And so smashed out the commercial subjects and did this and did that. And then I went, oh, because I, I, I used to instruct in um, RA um in the ultralight federation at gatton air park before it was actually an air park um and teaching in the drifters at 300 hours instructing in the drifter and looking back now in 2024 looking back then i feel really sorry for the people that i was instructing back then (laughs) because the quality of instruction now is significantly different but it's part of the growth right so you learn and you have mentors along the way and and that's really really important um so um, I got a pilot instructor rating, teaching design features, flight activities, because we're going to make the decathlon work. It doesn't pay for itself. And, mm. uh, and then I got grade three and we started up an RAO school and then COVID came and I was working. I, I finished in PNG. I was working at Qantas Link as an engineer for about six years. And then we were thinking about, going full time with the school. We're not really sure, you know, do we take that leap? And then COVID came and Qantas said, oh, you're a contractor, bye-bye. And went, oh, okay, well, I suppose we've had our decision made for us. And then ScoMo said, oh, we'll pay everybody a job keeper. Oh, great, you're going to pay me to transition into flying. That's actually excellent. So we we got there and then I, I got a grade three and then I got a grade two and then I got a grade one and then we opened up a one four one. So there's been a morph of things and constantly looking for how do we expand and then we put the brakes on and say well we're not ready to expand yet because we're not delivering the quality of what we want we want to we want to deliver better yeah it's one of the problems of expanding and even you can teach it all but if you haven't got the training materials set up properly and everything else you start doing it sort of half assed and i know i've been there myself and it's like ah, it's like the bolt the horse is already bolted and then you kind of get stuck don't you yeah, absolutely. And really, when, you, when you're trying to teach people to fly properly, you can't fake it till you make it. It's You've got to deliver the product appropriately so that when they go away, you know, hand on heart, failing something significantly going wrong from a systems point of view, those people have the skills to be able to not only care for themselves, but care for their passengers as well. So that's really, really important. So where we're at now is Karen's growing and she's the CFI of the RA stuff. I'm the who of the 141. We've got, uh, we invest in our people. So we were we were just talking like not half an hour ago, talking about people dropping instru- uh, um, a resume off. And, it, and that's a really interesting thing just as a sideline. With all of these schools that are around, we run a, a 138 Banateau operation, a 141 school with an RAOs flight training facility. And I can count on one hand how many people have knocked on the door with their CV looking for a job. That that amazes me. Wow. It really, really does. And when I get the CVs and I, I fly with people that are recent graduates, so, so you get a commercial pilot who you know, comes from somewhere that, I'm not going to name anybody, but they use like diamonds and they got FADIC airplanes and they say, I want to get some Cessna time because uh, you know my job's going to be a Cessna. And you see them in the airplane, they go, what's that red knob for? Well, that's called the uh, mixture control. Oh, you don't have FADIC? Where's the glass screens? Uh, well, all of our screens are glass and they're little and they're about three and a quarter inches round and There's they're all glass. Behind them. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's a transition, you know. And uh, so Karen's the CFI of the RA school and, and we've got um, an instructor that's where an RA Oz instructor that's working for us, who's come through from other schools and has been flying with us for a number of years. And we invest in those people. We teach them out of tube flying. We teach them energy management. We teach them a whole bunch of stuff, you know, what's unload mean? What's, what's our energy state? What's the stall stick position? What's, 
you know, we teach them how to fly without an airspeed indicator and, and all of that sort of thing. And we want them to progress. You know, and we're saying, you're going to get your commercial license, mate, because we're growing and we need a grade three flight instructor. And if you do that, we can help you step up if that's what you want to do. Yeah, 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 that's what I want to do. So he's got a carrot. And, and I would rather take somebody who's flown with us because we've instilled that culture in the training the primacy of training is really, really important. And um, rather than take somebody that's got an instructor rating from somewhere else and you go, mate, what are you going to do if the airspeed indicator fails? Oh, I don't know. I can't fly without the airspeed indicator. Okay. We have to do some work here. So I'd rather invest in people that are committed to us and have flown with us because they have that culture, you know, yeah, well, I'll talk on that and then I'll come back to something else in a minute. So it's an interesting, so as I was saying to you before we started, I've had a heap of feedback on last last episode 122 on the standards and everything else. And I always found it funny that when we talk instructors and hiring instructors, it always defaults back to this, we'd rather hire our own. People get a bit gun shy and skittish about hiring an instructor that's been trained somewhere else. Do you, do you find that as well? Yeah, hundred percent. So, what do you reckon that is? So, the, the, I keep hearing, well, Cass has got the standard, the, the flight test standard, and everything else. So, why is there a difference? Why is there so much? This is how we do it. Okay. Well, you touched on that in your previous podcast. I did. And the the syllabus is the syllabus, and. When I particularly teach formation training, I say to the people, look, the formation training says, and I just use it as an example, I need to, you need to be able to change from echelon left to echelon right. Now, there's like six or seven ways you can do that. You Absolutely. can pitch up, roll inverted, and then roll back upright on the other side. That's probably Half, not half the roll idea. over the top. Yeah. yeah, that's probably not the ideal way to do it. Or you can do it this way. And then... The other example that I give is if there was a syllabus of uh, Moz objective that says cross the M1 motorway, you could start on one side and wait for a break in the traffic and run across to the medium strip and then look the other way and then run across between the traffic or you could take the pedestrian bridge. One is safer than the other, but all CASA wants you to do is cross the motorway. They're it both outcomes based. How to do it. You know, so um, I would hope to think, I would like to think that most people would want to choose their instructors to have the best safe outcome, most cost effective and, and, and the, the most efficient way of doing things. But it really comes down to how much effort do I need to put into this person? Because at the end of the day, time and effort and money is what is how many hours am I going to spend? And I know you've said that there's, you know, line training to spend more money on line training means more money out of your pocket. Right. So whilst safety is not about dollars and cents, we can't put a price on safety, but we have to be mindful of the fact that our, our margins are very tight. And if we don't have to spend time, training people then we don't have to spend time training people so if i know that somebody who's in our organization already knows how to fly without an airspeed indicator understands attitude and power understands energy management understands stall stick position then i don't have to spend that time teaching them i can spend more time teaching them on how to patter and how to allow the student to make a mistake without jeopardizing the airplane for them to take over. For sure. Does that make sense? So, absolutely. So again, you're mentioning everything that I'm going to get to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> one, no, 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 it's good. So the one thing I'm, I keep getting, I've had, in, again, previously and in response to this episode is that I feel like I need more training, but the instructor or the school says we can't do it because it's not in the syllabus. And I'm like, what do you mean it's not in the syllabus? The syllabus is a sequence of lessons and plans. If you, if you finish that lesson, it's essentially a competent or not yet competent. Yeah. Or you add it to other flights to get back there. So 
I'm, I, what do you reckon about that? I keep, I keep hearing this come up. And I go, well, how can we not go and do some extra flights in addition to what the syllabus may pertain? If, you know, you've got someone from overseas coming in. It's a bit of a, a fruit salad syllabus, if you like. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got to get someone ready for an IPC. There is no syllabus for that. I just can see what they're doing and what I need to do to get them up to spec. Right. Have we well, lost the ability to think for ourselves or do we think that we can't and CASA don't allow that? What do you reckon about that? Well, I think I think the big question mark is people's interpretation of competency-based and what's their interpretation of competent, okay? So let's just look at one thing, for example, is I'll take stalling because it's just the classic example, right? If you look at the part 61 mods, there's five stalls that you have to do. There's the 1G wings level, straight ahead, idle stall, stall recovery. You've got stalls in a turn. You've got stalls in a takeoff configuration, stalls in a descent, and uh, stalls in approach to configuration. Now, the syllabus allows for one hour of stalls. There is no way that you can ca cover all five stall scenarios in one hour and be competent. Because the manual says, in order for us to assess that you're competent, you have to prove that you can do it correctly on two separate occasions. So out of those five stalls, that's at least 10 times that you have to stall the aeroplane. And if you've been shown how to do it and you can do it 10 times in one hour and, and get shown how to do it in one hour, good luck. And when we run our upset recovery training course, and as a matter of fact, upset recovery training course, we're actually moving away from that, that tag um, because UPRT is being associated with the airlines. So we're tagging our training for RA and GA pilots as loss of control prevention training. It's, it's a bit softer but it's more relevant. So yeah. when we do this training, we say to the people, when you do stall training, out of those five, which one do you remember doing? They go, oh, the 1G idle stall and stall recovery. Okay, that's cool. That's the only one they remember. But that's not the one that's going to kill you. It's all the other four that are going to kill you. Uh, and I think the problem is that people, that the instructors that are coming through don't feel confident doing anything but the 1G idle store and store recovery. So coming back to your question, what is competent? So there are four parts of competency for assessment that we use. When a pilot comes in the door, say, say I'm doing a spin endorsement, right? They're going to be unconscious incompetent. They have no idea what's going on and they can't do it. Then we're going to demonstrate to them and they're going to be conscious incompetent. They're going to go, yep, I'm aware that I've got no idea what I'm doing. And then we'll do some more training, and then they're going to become conscious competent. Yep, I can do it now, but I have to really dedicate a whole bunch of brain matter to doing it. And then they're going to go to the next step, which is con unconscious competent, which means, oh, I'm going to do a steep turn, and I'm going to tell you handing over shortly. And I'll just pull the stick back in a steep turn, let the aeroplane stall and spin it. And I'll go, your controls. And they just go, done. All right. So you didn't have to think about it. You just did it. So where do we want people to be in that four, in that little box? It's like a, um, a box with four sections in it. So for me to sign somebody off, I want them to be conscious, competent. You got to think about it and then do it because at the end of the day, a license is like you need a, in a Queensland, you need a hundred hours driving on the road to get a P plate, but we'll send people out with 25 hours for an RPL. Like, mm. I, I, I think that needs to be reviewed because it's a license to learn and we, we invite people back, but I regularly do flight reviews for people. I did a flight review with a guy last year. He had 1200 hours and he had like 78 hours dual over 25 years. And I'm like, 
So do you do any other training apart from your flight reviews? No, I got my license and I go and do my own thing and then I come back every two years and I do my hour or whatever. He flew okay. <laughs> yeah. But- well, this is always the thing is, is, again, what I say to my instructors when I'm training them, but also just, just pilots in general that – you know, they stuffed something up and I told them how to fix it and then they did an okay one. But that's basically rote. You just, you, in most cases, you corrected what I told you to do and you did it. Yeah. But I want you to see, see you do it in a natural environment on your own on the next flight. That way I can actually put my hand on my heart and go, okay, yeah, you, you understand what's going on. You're seeing the signs, the symptoms, whatever it is. Yeah. And um, make the corrections. And it's interesting about, you know, what competency means because it's, it's, there's the advisory circular right there. Competency is defined right in the front. Um, the combination of skills, knowledge, and behaviors required to perform a task to the required standards. So, whether that takes one flight or three, um, you know, the, 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 I believe there's flexibility in it to do what needs to be done. Yes. Well, coming back to your question about somebody who comes and says, Oh, I don't feel good about that. I want to do some more training. Oh, the syllabus doesn't allow for that. Um, anybody can come to me and say, Hey, listen, man, I, I, I don't think I am doing crosswind landings good enough. All right, well, jump in the plane and let's go do some training. Yeah. What, and I guess what, that, that fits into your 621385, which works well for someone that's licensed, but if they haven't got it yet, um, then it's just, well, you're not yet competent. You don't finish off that flight training record yet. We yeah. need to add some of those elements to the next one. We'll do it again. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really stunned to hear that mentality that is out there. Well, whoever wrote the general competency rule was a very smart person. Yeah. And, and I really like the, the methodology. You know, when I, when I was doing my grade three flight instructor upgrade, the, the place I went to, they said, oh, we've got two 172s. We've got one with a Garmin 1000 and we've got one with steam instruments. Which one would you like to fly? And I said, I'll take the one with the steam. I said, oh, don't you want to fly glass? I said, I've never flown on a Cessna 172 with a Garmin 1000. Mm. I'm going to become an instructor not to learn how to fly the Garmin 1000. So that's why I want to do that. And the, the general competency is something that people don't really appreciate or understand. Well, they don't even know it exists. Like the number of times I make people aware of it. Um, I was talking to someone the other day that had an instructor grade one, didn't even know what the mods was. Oh, really? How did they get oh, no, I truly really hope they're kidding. But I know there's some people who have been in the industry for a while, pre-61, um, yeah. so that's pre-2014 for those who aren't aware, um, into the old car CAR five days, which was our licensing uh, system. And, yeah, just haven't bothered to look at where all this stuff's coming from and what the new syllabus is. It's, uh, it's a worry. So how is this not being picked up, you know, on – EPCs and FERs and everything else. Well, it, it's it's interesting because the flight examiners are really the stopgap there, aren't they? Really. Big time. Uh, not not to not to point a, a crosshair on them, but the crosshair is there. It's everything that I've done with UPRT and, and you asked about earlier about you know, how did I get involved with the UPRT, but everything that I've been involved with every single seminar, every single online um, program that I've engaged in, it all comes back to the flight instructor and then forward on to the flight examiner. And I've had, I've had flight ex, uh, uh, commercial pilots who come to me, uh, to do a tailwheel endorsement. And I had one particular young fella, super nice guy, but he did not exude any confidence whatsoever. And to fly the decathlon, just for him to fly the level attitude without, like I don't have an AH in my decathlon. It's, it's day VFR, right? We don't need one. I don't need to spend that money. I've got a real horizon out the front. And and he couldn't fly a level attitude. And after four hours, I'm going like, mate, you have to fly the level attitude. And if you look to the left, there is an a aerobatic aid called the spider, which tells you where level is. So you can look out the left window and put the spider horizontal with the horizon and then look to the front, and that's your level attitude. After four hours, he still couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, and that blows me away. So uh, 
it's it's challenging, just totally challenging. But how do you feel the change from the Day VFR syllabus to the Moz has impacted on on? We, we can't really talk about the quality of training per se, maybe, but just what's included, what's expected of a, a commercial pilot. We'll stick with a CPO holder. Things like poor weather configuration, minimum radius turns, um, recipient spinning, all that sort of stuff's been taken out, either because maybe it's too hard to get a spinning aeroplane now and after the DA-40 crash, mm. we've sort of gone right against it. Um, but just even general handling flight envelope stuff, understanding the difference between normal and utility category, um, being able to do wing overs, the 60 degree bank in any aeroplane and understanding the flight envelope and flying the aeroplane to more of 100% of its capability and, and 60% of yours instead of most students are completely the other way around and maxing out and just basic manoeuvres with nothing to give in the in an emergency situation. Yeah. Um, Loaded question. Indeed. Uh, look, I think that... Um, I think that right or wrong, the, the Moz does outline everything. And I went through, uh, I looked at the uh, ICAO DOC 111, which is the UPRT um, outline for what uh, upset prevention and recovery training is about. And I went through the Moz and everything that's required in there is in the Part 61 Moz. Now, if you couple that, there was two. There was two items that were missing, and they were both contained about energy management uh, in the low-level endorsement. So those two bits, coupled with the Part sixty-one, they're they're already all there in RPL, PPL, and CPL, but we're just not teaching it properly, and it's the method with which we teach, and we have. A lot of layover, and like you said, there's a lot of uh, rote learning going on. Um, I did a spin endorsement uh, a number of years ago for a group of uh, flight instructor candidates, and I put a YouTube video up on it. It's either on Bad Attitude Advanced Flight Training Facebook page or on the YouTube. I think it's on the Facebook page. And I, I labelled it. Um, stall pattern techniques or something like that. And I was sitting in the airplane. I said, let's just do a wings level 1G straight ahead stall. Why don't you pattern me through a wings level 1G straight ahead stall? And he just wrote, learn what he was told to deliver. And at the end of it, I said, Okay, that was pretty good. Like he handled the stall quite well and he recovered it and he talked it through like he did. I said, that's really great, but you never mentioned the word angle of attack once. Not once. And he said, well, but that that's the way that we were told to patter it. And I go, well, that's not what we currently need to teach. Nobody knows. Uh, a lot of people don't know the term. I was flying with a guy today. He hadn't flown since before COVID. He's got 500 hours. I said, okay, we'll just do a straight ahead stall because he's doing a tailwind endorsement. And the first thing we do is go and handle the aeroplane and do some stalls and get the feel for it. I said, okay, just bring the stick back to the stall stick position. He goes, oh, what's that? I said, yeah, which I find fascinating because the stall stick was referred to in the day VFR syllabus. Yeah. So a lot of people bypassed it. Um, yeah. It says – because I, I dug out the old Davy Far syllabus because I'm starting to cross compare now. And yeah, observe indicated airspeed and control wheel stick position at the point of departure from intended flight path, by either stall. There you go. So, do you want to just loosely run through with everyone what stall stick position is and how we can use it? Well, stall stick position, and it, it's really interesting you say that because it, it goes to a, a broader conversation when I talk, when you talk about the technology and, and, we could we could spin off for hours talking about all of these spin offs, but um, um, technology and people are going. We need we need angle of attack indicators in the aeroplane. We need to have these things mounted on the dash so we can see them. And and as a matter of fact, one of the reasons when when I first got interested in UPRT, I watched um, an eight hour NTSB seminar uh, in two thousand and fourteen that had Paddy Wagstaff in it. And there was these two young fellas, they invited these two young fellas who were university graduates 
And they said, oh, yes, we've been developing this uh, Bluetooth technology where we'll mount something on the wing which will Bluetooth angle of attack information to your glasses in a heads-up display so that whilst you're in the circuit and you're looking at, around for traffic, you can actually see the attitude or the angle of attack um, so you don't have to look at the angle of attack indicator on the dash. You could be looking over your shoulder and looking for traffic and you'll still see your angle of attack information. And everybody was going, oh, yes, yes, very good, very good, very good. And uh, the, the, uh, they asked Patty Wagstaff, what do you think about that, Patty? And Patty said, yep, that's really cool. That's really innovative. It's wonderful. But why don't we just teach people to fly the airplane properly? And that sentence, after watching that eight-hour thing, that sentence grabbed me by the throat and, nice. and said, wow. So talking about stall-stick position, when we do our loss of prevention, our loss of control prevention training, I, I engage people. The, the first half of the day is talking about stability and trimming because a lot of pilots don't understand static and dynamic stability and they keep moving controls around to try and get the result that they want when the aeroplane just needs you to give it what it wants. And one of the things that we engage people in to think about is how many angle of attack in, how many aeroplanes have angle of attack indicators? And people go, oh, well, I fly a Cherokee and it doesn't have one, and I fly a Cessna and it doesn't have one. And I'll say to them, I guarantee you that there are 100% of aeroplanes that have a um, angle of attack indicator 100% some of them have two some of them have two oh what do you mean and I said well the first one is the if you if you have a yoke and you pull the yoke back all the way when you get to the back stop that's the red part the end of the red part on your angle of attack indicator so it doesn't matter what attitude you have what power setting you have and what airspeed you have. If you pull that stick back to the backstop, you will stall. End of story. Doesn't matter what's going on. The other thing is challenging them to understand their energy um, state by talking about the relationship between their vertical speed indicator and their attitude. So if I'm flying straight and level and my VSI is reading zero, I have a small angle of attack. I'm efficient. I'm flying straight and level. If I put full power and raise the nose and my attitude is above the horizon and my VSI is pointing up, then I might have a high angle of attack because I'm creating more lift, but it's controlled. If I go from a straight and level and I reduce the power and the nose pitches down, if my VSI is pointing down and I'm if my VSI is indicating a descent and my nose is pointing down, I have a controlled angle of attack. Now, if I leave the power at idle and raise the nose and I'm pointing up and my VSI is saying I'm going down, my angle of attack is extreme. Yeah. And you're going to get that in a stall. So understanding the relationship between attitude and, and, uh, and the vertical speed indicator is the second angle of attack indicator. And, and it's really interesting. I have a lot of commercial pilots and a lot of recreational pilots who, who do not understand the relative airflow. So without getting into a, a flying lesson, a lot of people think that the relative airflow is horizontal. And I have one yeah. commercial pilot say, I, I'd say, oh, if I'm flying straight level, where's my relative airflow coming from? Oh, straight ahead. What if I get in a climb? Oh, it's still horizontal. Oh, really? What if I'm in a descent? It's still horizontal. Okay. The decathlon's aerobatic. If I pitch the nose up and go vertically, if I'm in an F-18 and I put afterburner on and I'm going up vertically, where's my relative airflow from? Oh, it's still horizontal. Why do you mm. think that? Because that's the way it's drawn in all the textbooks. 90 it's degree always, angle of attack. It's always horizontal. And I had another guy say, well, where do you get your relative airflow information from? He said, napes or the windsock. And Rel I'm like, yeah, right -o. Oh, that's a new one. <laughs> oh man, really? Okay. Yeah, wow. Yeah, blow, blows you away some of this stuff. What what do you think the the fear of stalling is? Like when we're talking not just pilots or student pilots, but some instructors and and dare I say, you know, 
head of operations have been in this case that they just really don't like them and avoid it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's because the industry makes it sound scary. We tell our students, oh, we're going to do stalling today. We're going to have a whole bunch of fun. And they're like, what? Yeah, we're going to have a whole bunch of fun. Yeah. And the first thing we do is we do a wings level 1G stall. And all we do is just unload the stick and the nose just moves like that much. You're sneaking up on it. We're just sneaking up on it. And if they're really apprehensive, we don't do any more than that on the first lesson. So we have a, a basic stalling. And then after they go solo, we do advanced stalling. And we pop them in the decathlon. And it's about consequence. Like some people are just like, yeah, let's get into this. You know, I'll throw it on its back. She'll be good, mate. And But there are other people who's just like, 10 degrees angular bank, that's my, and I did a spin endorsement recently and this, he was an instructor candidate. He said, oh, I don't like to do any more than 10 or 20 degrees. I go, well, mate, I need you to do a 60 degree angular bank level turn for the clearing turn after we do our hassle checks. So crank it over and let's start pulling on that stick, you know, um, that they just don't have the confidence. Do, do you think not having aircraft like, aerobats and that sort of thing so readily available has contributed to this and potentially casters move away um, because, you know, we said we had that terrible DA-40 accident, the aircraft was not the proof of spinning, whether it can or not recover is irrelevant. Are we not doing it because we can't access these aircraft or are we not willing to come and see a specialist like you? I understand that potentially has a costume post and it's, you know, if it's not within the local area, that makes it all very difficult. But is it right to then just move away from that training altogether? Oh, that's a really you, – you asked me a loaded question before and you just laughed. It's just like – I'm full of them. You got the bucket loader out and you just dumped the whole bucket. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's valid, isn't it? It's like oh, – it's, it's so – and I don't know if we can truly answer it here, but, you know, like I just know from, from my Aero Club days we had the 152, so it was just there. We, we could do some loops and barrel rolls and things – throughout GPT RPL training. Um, yeah. We could do it through commercial training. China Southern, they had the grobs. A couple could spin. The rest, they went next door to either us or, or the Robin. Um, I don't know what it's been like at other schools, but I know most always had a, a Super D out the back or something like that that they could use for that and and, and offer tail and aerobatic training at the same time. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I know Dave Pilkington will be sitting on the edge of his seat listening to this. But the the decay in the um, the, the spinning environment, the, the unusual attitude environment, um, has been prevalent over many many decades. Um, we actually bought our decathlon off Dave, and I vividly remember he, he's a great um, he's a great ambassador for safety, Dave. Um, and we went to look at, do a pre-purchase inspection on the aeroplane. I said, I want to take it for a test flight. And he goes, when was the last time you did a spin? Like right off the bat, I'm just going to take the aeroplane for a flight to see if I want to buy it. When was the last time you did a spin? So you take any opportunity to try and help somebody understand that. And, and this leads into something that happened. Uh, I went down to Adelaide um, to a great bunch of people at command flight training. And uh, hello, Michael down there. And um, we we I'm just dinner. talking to him today, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, great guy, great, great bunch of people. And flew uh, did a upset recovery uh, course with those people, and flew with his head of operations. And we were in the aeroplane, and I just took a leaf out of Dave's book, and I go, "Mate, was the last time you did a spin?" Because we were talking about upset recovery, we weren't talking about spin recovery, right? We were talking about the prevention is better than the cure, right? And and he goes, oh, last time I did a spin, um, oh, 25 years ago when I got my instructor rating. And I go, oh, all right. Well, how about you demonstrate to me entry and recovery? And so he did that and I had to assist him to get out of it. Now that's, that's because there's no recurrent requirement. And... No, that's right. You know, it's a it's a perishable skill, and if you don't use it, you lose it. 
well, and as you know, it changes from aircraft to aircraft. Oh. The, longer you, the longer you're into it, it takes about half as much time to get out of it. Yep, 100%. Um, 10 spins in. Another 15 so, out, so, yeah. In, in answer to your question about what do I think about the decay of, of all that sort of stuff, um, aviation's got really expensive. Hmm. Um, it, it is cost driven. And if the large majority, there's, there's three types of people. There's people who are just insatiable appetite to learn as much as they can. And they're the people that I really enjoy flying with because they are just sponges and they just like, what? I can do that. Oh, and I can stop that. Tell me more. Tell me more. And, and you engage with those people. Then you've got the other group that, it's just like, I got my license. What do I need to do that training for? I'm just going to go out and punch holes in the sky and do what I want to do. And they're not going to learn. And, and unfortunately, you're not going to be able to help those people. Then there's everybody in between. And the, the ratio, the, the, the middle people, they're the fence sitters. They're like, yeah, I want to go and do some more training, but I'm either too scared or it costs too much money. And um, unfortunately, there's only three reasons why people will engage in training. They either have to do it, they want to do it, or there's a financial incentive to do it. Um, we've tried to encourage people. We get so many people say, oh, yeah, I really want to do that upset recovery training or that loss of control training because I know that it's good and it'll help me save and think, okay, well, we got a course on next week or whatever. You want. Oh, yeah, but I can't afford it. Okay, that, that's fair. Um, so we try to keep the cost as, as low as possible without impacting the quality and the, the delivery of the training. But at the end of the day, it does cost more. But um, loss of control remains and it has always been almost half of the fatal accidents. Yeah. And well, that statistics is, is static. It doesn't change. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a CFIT and UFIT accidents all day through the ATSB website, let alone the NTSB website. There was another one I saw the other day, just an aeroplane took off, just turned and then dropped a wing and in it went. Yeah. Do you think, like, <clears throat> we'll get into exactly what it all is in a minute, but do you think UPRT slash, you know, loss of control training is kind of hopefully the new MCC in that people were trying to do MCC but – it wasn't extra training. It wasn't required. So it was a fantastic thing and what it was going to do, um, but it just wasn't required, so no one did it. But now everyone needs MCC. Yeah. Well, you you ask really, really tough questions, mate. <laughs> Should give you more warning. <laughs> oh, do you think man. this is something that needs to be, even in a, a lesser part, or just can we just focus on proper training you know, like, you know, I put my instructors, I've only got a 172 NNM. Yeah. So not great. But at the same time, the 172 is so damn stable. If you do not hold that stick all the way back, it will break out and go into spiral die, which I reckon is almost more threatening than than just holding a nice spin and then being able to break out of it. Yeah. It's almost more challenging. So as long as I train them more than what they're going to need to do um, for a student that might drop a wing too much and get a little bit funky, yeah. Is that enough? Or do we really need to look at incorporating this more, going back to some of the VFR syllabus techniques that we had or yeah. a separate training unit? So that's that's re another really interesting question. So I, I fly with people who got their spin endorsement in a in a one seven two that's in the utility category. And I'm like, mate, you gotta work really, really hard to spin a 172. It is such a stable platform and it's designed so well to prevent you from getting in trouble. And what happens is people go and get their license on a 172, then they go buy an RB6 and they start throwing that stick around and next thing you know, they're on their back. And if they survive, they're just like, holy crap, I'm going to sell this and go and take up underwater basketball or something, you know? Like, yeah find another hobby um should it be a bolt-on this is a this is a discussion that we have 
uh, people who are delivering UPRT, who I engage with anyway, um, there's two camps here. There's, there's should it be a bolt-on training or should it be immersed in, in the flight training? And, and this sort of dovetails back into what you're saying about the Part 61 Moz. And if I want to cross the road, I'm going to teach people how to cross the road so that later on down the way, their law of primacy reflects back. And I'll give you a story on that real quickly. We had a guy who had 800 hours flying, multi-IFR, and he wanted to do a tailwheel endorsement. He wanted to do a flight review, so he said, oh, i do a tailwheel endorsement. And on the very first, on the very first lesson, I said, give me your takeoff safety brief. And he goes, oh, well, if I have an engine failure, I'm going to land straight ahead below 700 feet. And if I have an engine failure after 700 feet, I'm going to turn back. And I go, okay, are you going to lower the nose? He goes, oh, yeah, of course I'll lower the nose. And I said, I don't think you will. And he said, why not? I said, because... For 800 hours, you've been telling yourself, if I have an engine failure, I'm going to land straight ahead. And you've been flying for five years. So for five years, you've been telling yourself, if I have an engine failure, yeah. I'm going to land straight ahead. So I said, here's our takeoff safety brief. If I have an engine failure, my immediate action is lower the nose to the flap set attitude, fly the airplane, blah, 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 blah. And he, goes, and he said that we did seven flights. And he said that for the subsequent six flights. And on the seventh flight at 300 feet, I pulled the power on him. And he just looked over his shoulder and said, I'm going to land over there. Oh, no, hang on a second. I've got to lower the nose. But his immediacy and his primacy yeah, so just strong. went, I'm going to land over there. Oh, crap. We just spent six flights talking about lowering the nose first. So it wasn't primary. So been working a long time with Neil Schaefer from RAOs. Neil and Jill from RAOs, great. They come to visit Karen and myself a number of years ago and we sat for a week and we took the, the decathlon or Cetabria or whatever we had at the time up and we dissected where can we implement loss of control techniques in the syllabus so that we create that primacy. So just as a really quick example, when we do effects of controls, we just don't go, okay, if I pull the stick back, the nose goes up. What we will say is if I ease the stick back and raise, raise the nose to the climb attitude and I want to hold that climb attitude, as the airplane slows down, I need to put more back stick in to hold that attitude. And then when I release the back pressure, the nose will lower because we've been talking about the downforce on the tail that a lot of pilots, 25 year pilot with a thousand hours. Are you telling me that the tail creates downforce? Uh-huh. Well, that answers a lot of questions. So we, we take it. Well, that hopefully in the level. straight level brief, but maybe not. Well, you'd be surprised how many people don't know. Uh, we just got a Fuji, actually. It's a great aeroplane. It's aerobatic. It's it's um, normal utility and aerobatic category, four seat, constant speed, 180 horse. And the tailplane on that, you can see it from like 100 metres away. You go, that tail is upside down. That's an upside down wing. The top of the horizontal stabiliser is dead flat. You can put a tablecloth yeah. on it, you know, and have a tea party. It's, it's so relevant. So this is where we need to go. And RAOs, in their, to their credit, Neil has worked so hard to put loss of control elements. So when you're doing your, like a GA instructor rating, you, you've got the elements of the, the lesson. And then at the end, you've got a threat and error management content. Then you've got an airmanship content. Well, we're putting a loss of control content in as well. So when we go... You know, oh, we're doing this. And so the airmanship call, uh, content is is um, don't use high power over rocks because we're going to pick up stones and damage component. Threat and error management, we use the clock code so that we can teach people. And the loss of control thing is don't pull the stick back when you've got low power, you know, or, you know, don't exceed the critical angle or don't do that or don't do that. So, and, and so that's, and, and I can only speak about our students, 
when our students talk, they're using terminology like, oh, I just unloaded that stick and, and everything was okay. And I was cautious of my stick position. And, you know, like this is the language that we should be using to help educate people. And we've had people visit us and, and okay, that kid was talking about unloading. Was he taking stuff out of the aeroplane? No, mate. He was talking about reducing the angle of attack and, and it, Oh, angle of attack. Yeah, I read about that. Yeah, well, you need to know about that. Mate. Yeah, I think if you come from that aerobatics background or whatever, you'll get it and you'll understand it. If you've been taught by someone who's teaching you those things, I know I've done it with people who've been flying for aeros for years and mm. it's just not a term they're thinking of and they're getting buffet and everything else. I said, just unload it a bit. You're just, just trying to make it do something it doesn't want you to do. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just another way of telling you back off. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, as I always say to people, when, when you get into an aeroplane, you strap on that 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 suit belt. The aeroplane should be becoming an extension of your body. It should be becoming one with it. it. Sounds all very mantric and nicely nice holistic, but it's it's what it is. And, and a, a racing car driver will tell you the same thing. Yeah. Um, well, just to put it in context, though, Trent, what I find is there's two types of people that are doing aviation, and um. Like I mentioned earlier, there's those people that are the insatiable thirst for knowledge. There are two types of people that I see in aviation. People who have a pilot's license and people who want to be aviators. And the people who come out to the airfield, pull their plane out, go for a fly for an hour, put the plane away, give it a bit of a polish, kiss on the spinner, and then go home, they're pilots. <laughs> yep. They do that. The aviators are... Oh, Paul, can you tell me how to change a tyre? Okay, can you tell me how to do this? Well, you should do the Schedule 8 course. Oh, can I do that? Can I? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they come along and they do that. And, and then they come back and they go, I changed my spark plugs the other day. I was so happy. You know, like I say, I yeah. saved $140 because I didn't have to pay somebody to do it. I said, did you gap it properly? And he goes, oh, maybe I'll take them out and gap them properly. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, like you always challenge somebody to, to be better and, and leave them something to think about, you know. So yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So l lots of conscious, uh, lots of consciousness. I can't say that. Lots of control in flight training. Um, you know, how, how many hours does it sort of consist of? And and you know, apart from it's your business and everything else. But w w how do you think um, anyone, PPL, RPL, CPL, should uh, look at doing something along those lines? Well, it's not mandated for a start. So we can't say it's competency-based because it's not measured to a standard. And this is part of the problem. Um, like I said earlier, there are some people who want to have, a, have, a, have it as a bolt-on and there are other people who think that it should be ingrained in. Now, we have to, to, to try and help pilots be safer, um, understanding the loss of control elements um, is not going to happen in my lifetime, your lifetime, um, because it's going to be by osmosis. It's going to be so slow to catch on um, because it does cost money and, and, and all that stuff. What I find, we would. Do you think that matters? Because it could it not just be made a formal MOS syllabus flight activity? that is there for someone to do, like aerobatics or spinning oh, or look formation? At you, look at you go with another bucket full of dirt to put on the head <laughs> question, right? So... Because um, surely that can be up to people that can decide whether that's something for them or not and they can afford it. That's going to yeah, be with any, um, any add-on. But by doing that just makes it more recognised, I guess, that, you know, if the yeah. regulator goes, you know what, this is actually something good. You've, you've had talks with CASA and airline level and all this sort of stuff before. Yeah that makes it not, not a sort of side thing. It's actually got a bit of recognition now that this is something we should be looking at. It's coming. It's coming. It's, um, it's, you know how long it takes to get stuff through CASA, right? Now, CASA has a job to do. They have to do their due diligence and they have to assess all of the information and then do their process. And um, I can tell you that, that there are, uh, numerous people in CASA that are very engaged and they understand that this needs to be done um, and they have a process that they need to go through. 
Um, what is important is that industry leads the way on this because the documents, all the documents that CASA have to go through are for airlines. There's nothing written for GARA. That's the same in for FAA as well? Yeah, absolutely. EASA is the only regulatory body on the planet that has mandated training, EPRT training, and that's for commercial pilots only, right? So I've seen, I've had people with 35 hours who hadn't, haven't even got a license yet come and do loss of control training. And I've had people with, 20,000 hours come and do training. I've actually had an ex-RAF Hawker Harrier pilot who did combat in Argentina do elements of UPRT with his tailwind endorsement. And I'll tell you the story real quick because it's such a cool story. And as an instructor, any instructor will just go, you can shoot me now. You can take my life now, Lord Jesus Christ, because my job here is done. This guy... Um, a very unassuming guy, and he did his tailwheel endorsement, no airspeed indicator, all attitude power, just listening to the engine, no RPM gauge, no airspeed indicator, we're just flying around. He sends me a, a, a message about a year afterwards, and he says, I oh, just a short message to let you know I went flying the other night, uh, and I had, on the third circuit, I had a total electrical failure, I lowered the nose to what I thought was the level attitude, listened to the engine and pulled it back to what I thought was 2300 RPM, did an uneventful circuit and landing. And I just want to let you know that you probably saved the day. Thank you for the, everything. And I just go, holy crap, man. My job here that's is That's what done. it's all about, isn't it? Then he takes yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So um, the, the things that we're doing uh, like the UPRT conference I ran in 2022. And the reason why I ran the first UPRT conference uh, was because I was doing so much research about loss of control training and all this sort of stuff. It's not mandated. There's nowhere to get information. How do we do this? What are we doing? And I'm doing what everybody else is doing. And I'm looking at the data and, in, and, and extracting from the ICAO documents what I think is applicable to this. And I went, man, I'm, I'm looking at YouTube videos and people are doing different things to what I'm doing. Am I on drugs? Am, am I doing it the wrong way? And so I just went, you know what? I'm going to just invite anybody who teaches UPRT to come to Kabulcha and let's just sit around and talk about how do we, how do we teach this stuff? What are we doing? Because I want to make sure I'm not on drugs. How are we, how are we teaching this stuff? You know? And Don't you find that the, the 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 sitting down, the briefing, like I always tell people, I spend more time, you say, you must have so many hours. I said, well, I probably would if I logged my briefing hours. But the, the, I think the time spent in a classroom briefing is just as valuable and if anything can help with the understanding and what's going on than just, you know, the odd brief as we walk out to an aeroplane. Oh, ab Absolutely. Uh, the controlled air conditioned environment where you're sitting there with a whiteboard. Nobody gets intimidated by a whiteboard too much compared to um, a nose down attitude with the aircraft rotating it. At, uh, yeah. Uh, you know. Do you, here's another loaded question for you. Okay, go ahead. The people I've spoken to, those that would love to brief more that don't, is typically because the pilot award does not cover briefing time for instructors. So it's up to the employer as to whether they pay, charge and pay for, for briefing time or not. Do you think that is contributing to a degradation of time spent on the ground as well? Wow. You are so good. Um, so at our well, these, are the, these are all the things I want to tackle, you know. These yeah, are all absolutely. the things I'm identifying. That's, that's and. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, so at our school, we charge for briefings. And there are other schools in our area that don't charge for briefings. Now, our hourly rate for the aeroplane is cheaper than the other school's hourly rate. 
Okay. So when you're in the aeroplane, you don't pay as much. But I've seen videos of other schools because, you you know, you, you keep your friends close and your competitors closer, right? And so this other school, engine running, sitting at the holding point going, right out. Now, when we get up there, what we're going to do, and I'm going like, oh, hang on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> That's a briefing, man. When we get up there, this is what we're going to do. And he's paying a lot more than what our charge is when the engine's running, but we charge for the briefings. So if we charge for the briefings, we pay our instructor. And you've got nothing else to focus on than the briefing. Right. Not being distracted, not getting threatened near management by the sounds of it if you're talking about it at the holding point. Yeah. So, um, you know, but it comes down to how do we teach it? What's the best way? So it, there's a business model because – We've all got to pay the mortgage and we've got to pay. You know, if anybody mm. thinks that running an airline or running a flying school is all about the cost of fuel, you got another thing coming. So um, we've all got bills to pay and they have to be met. That's that's the thing. But, you know, um, we're, we're a big advocate of um, when the flying's done, the plane's away, the paperwork's done, um, you sit around the table with some refreshments and uh, you learn more at the table than you do in the airplane. Definitely. So Definitely. Um, look, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a big animal to digest. It's, it's a massive animal. It is, but You've got a lot to look at. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's why it's so important. Uh, like, so when I invited all the people to come to the first UPRT conference, I was blown away. Five people from Casa Camp, two insurance companies, and people came from all over Australia. I was just gobsmacked. Just like, wow. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So right. as I've mentioned in the uh, in the, the last episode, we used to have the CFI conference because we were all CFIs at the time, chief flying instructors. Yeah. Um, different to the American certified flying instructor. Yeah. And, yeah, like absolute think tank, two days, everyone's head together, swapping stories, ideas. I know we did some fantastic um, things, had different guest speakers and got to meet the, the, the chairperson of CASA at the time and all that sort of thing. Yeah. We haven't done that for, for many, many years now, although Safe Skies Conference is still going. Yes. So I don't know if you got this going to necessarily replace that, but um, do you want to just – I know you sort of loosely touched on it, so we don't have to go through it again, but just how the uh, the, the workshop came up and how you've got one for, for pilots and for instructors and who's and everything and um, yeah, what, so, when, it, when, when it is and everything. Right. So um, I, I did the UPRT in August 22, the UPRT conference, and was blown away by that and, and tried to do more to engage people. And there were clearly people who attended that hadn't read the documentation and they, they weren't across the intent of the data. Um, and that was the purpose of it, was to bring people together who had an interest in it to, to try and get some sort of cohesion so that we could do what you said before. Let's, let's go and get the people that are doing it, put together some thoughts so we can go to CASA and say, hey, that's good for the airlines, but this is how we think we need to do it there. Um, it sort of had a couple of other meetings and, and stuff, but it sort of ground to a bit of a halt. But I did, when I listened to your last podcast, I did go on to Safe Skies and I actually, I, I actually in uh, got a log on and they are still having uh, 15th of May is their drop dead for a, a, a submission for speakers and I went, I'd love to do this. And I tried to log on and I couldn't find the button to submit the thing. And I tried it like five times and I wrote an email to them and I haven't had a reply yet. So before that, I, I've put together this, this um, event that's happening in June and uh, June, July. Um, the way that come about is um, I wanted to get some sort of creditation for the UPRT training that I was delivering. And by doing that 
EASA is the only people who do a course. So I went, okay, well, I've got to contact EASA. And I, I contacted a provider in Australia who is delivering EASA training. And I said, can I please come down and do your instructing, uh, UPRT instructing? And um, the answer I got was, it's only for people that are doing the EASA course, so you can't attend. Okay. So I phoned up a couple of providers in Europe and I said, do you provide the, uh, it's a 745 uh, FCL 745 course. And uh, they said, oh, yes, yes, you can come. No problem. Just uh, come down the road and come and fly our extra. No problem. And I just went, okay, well, this airfare and this accommodation and then this flying. And, and, and I just went, whoa, that's a lot of money to spend. Um, that's not going to help the Australian industry. That's not going to help our business. I mean, super cool fun. I just go on a holiday. My wife and I can go and we can do all this and it'd be really cool fun. But it doesn't help the business. You come back and go, oh, I've done a course in Europe. Oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, Rich Stoll is um, quite well known in the US uh, and he's been labelled the um, uh, one of the instigators of modern UPRT, uh, one of the founders and developers of modern UPRT. Um, very unassuming gentleman, uh, great guy to talk to uh, and to work with. Um, and uh, there's another company in the States called APS that do a lot of airline and military training with extras and, you know, jets and all that sort of stuff. And... I've paid for a lot of their online training and done their courses and got the certificate of attendance and all that sort of stuff. Um, and Rich is now doing some work with them as their GA interface, which is really, really good because previously over the last few years, it's all been airlines and military and all that sort of stuff. Great bunch of guys and girls doing what they can do. Now, <sighs> I phoned Rich up because I'd talked to him a couple of times and he actually was keynote speaker at our August 22 um, conference. And I said, Rich, you ever been to Australia? Because if I was going to spend that money to go to Europe and, and do that training, why don't we get somebody here so that everybody can benefit from it? And he said, well, I've been threatened to come down, but I haven't. And then um, so I said, well, why don't you come down? We'll put a program together for you and you can come and do this. What's it going to cost? Oh, it's going to cost this, cost this, cost this, airfares, accommodation, price per day for training and this and that and all that sort of stuff, speaking and all that sort of stuff. And um, Rich just released a new book recently. Yep, got my copy the other day. It arrived. Excellent. Well, you can get it signed if you come down. I will bring it with me. Excellent. Yeah, no, I'll, I will be there. And um, John T from... Pilot Train, who is the Australian distributor, he's just come on board for the sponsorship. Uh, he's a bronze sponsor for the conference. And uh, he's coming up to promote, Rich has got another book coming out and you can get pre-buys and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So um, there's lots of engagement, uh, talking to a lot of people, um, Agile Insurance with Mike Dalton. He's been a great supporter of, my efforts to do UPRT expansion um, and they're talking about coming on board um, and, and there's a lot of engagement, but for what we're talking about with the instructing, I actually wanted to get um, a closed workshop with whoever CASA wanted to come for train the trainer and RAOs and um, CASA wasn't too keen on that. Uh, and it made me real think, really think about what can we do. So Rich and I had a chat and we just went, you know what, talking to people, listening to podcasts, you and talking to Jeff Hunt and, you know, Right Air and, and all of these first job providers who are seeing the fallout of poor standards. Um, Rich and I said, why don't we get 141, 142 providers and, at a table and then have the first job providers at a table and then people like that passionate airline guy and have the airlines because they're feeling it as well. And we just get everybody in the one room 
And I didn't even know about Safe Skies until I heard your podcast. And then I just went, oh, I heard what you're saying about it. And I go, like, why isn't that happening? You know, but we'd already talked about doing this. So that's what I wanted to do on the 1st and 2nd of July is invite these people. And what's difficult for me is it's just Karen and I doing what we're doing and we're trying to keep the wheels turning and then, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night and I go, oh, we better stop sending emails to all these one for one schools that I found on the internet, which I don't get any replies from because I've got to go to inquiries at and there's some ops manager who doesn't know. Yeah, a filter. <laughs> And it's just the shit filter just takes care of that, right? So, you know, this is an opportunity to, to and Rich is going to be one of the mediators there. And it's just an opportunity for you guys, the first job providers, to talk to the one for ones And it's not a bitch fest. It's about, hey, guys, when I get people, they can't fly a circuit or... They don't know what power setting to use for a climb or whatever. It's just like, this is where we need to fix it. And I, I wanted to have the public the opportunity to sit and observe. So it's a two-day thing, um, and I think it needs to be two days because there is just a lot of elephant to chew, right? And I invited it. I wanted to have the public... And Casa said that they'll come and attend. So, okay, you want to attend, but you don't want to sponsor or or be part of it. That's fine. You can sit in the audience and listen and write down on your notepads. That's fine. But I wanted the last session after lunch on the second day for questions and answers from the floor. And that's really, really important because I remember before uh, – and. I have to pinch myself sometimes because here I'm a grade one flight instructor with my own flying school and I'm doing all of this stuff. And I remember back when I was like in 1989 and I go, Oh, there's a flight grade one flight instructor. And he's just walking along. Hello, morning chaps. How are we? You know? And I'm just like, now I are one, you know, like I, I, I've got the opportunity to try and do something, but I had ideas when I was back there. Hey, and, Everybody's who's been middle management or working on the floor in whatever industry they are, ah, the bosses are full of crap. They should be doing it this way. We want the public to listen to what's going on because there's probably somebody in the audience that will just say, did you guys ever think about... Yeah. And everybody can look at themselves and go, holy crap. We're, we're so focused in what we're doing. We didn't you always need the outside, the, the, box. the outsider looking in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's important because when you're when you're sitting in the audience and you're going, oh, oh, Mister Carter, Mister Carter, what, I've got something to say. I want to say something, and you don't get a chance to say. It. But then when you do say it, they all go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for your input. We'll we'll, we'll take note of that, and it never sees the light of day. We gotta we gotta remember that there are people out there who are smart, who don't have the qualifications, but they're savvy enough to give us something that we could use. Yeah, no, definitely. So that's the uh it's uh uprtconference.com. Yes, to sir. go and register. Yes. And uh so there's a uh, the twenty eighth of June is a public forum with Rich and he's just gonna talk about loss of control and he's done like thirty five thousand spins. <laughs> um, and that's just amazing. Not all at once, I must say. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but um, and, and that's going to be really great. You can meet with him. The, the and uh, chance to fly. Yeah, and then the 29th and 30th, we're working really hard with CASA for a certificate of validation. And to be honest, CASA are really supportive. They're just like, yeah, we understand what you're trying to do. Let's do it this way and, and get us these documents. And But they've got a process to go through. And we need to understand that as the industry, we need to understand that there are people in CASA that are trying to help do the Absolutely. right thing. Absolutely. But, but they are bound by their process. So there are uh, opportunities to fly with Rich. We've got our 8 KCAB decathlon. Um if you, if you haven't got a tail endorsement, that's okay. Rich can get it on and off the planet for you. That's fine. And and have a bit of fun with the master. And we also have the Fuji, um, which is a tricycle undercarriage. So for those that are 
um, uh, a bit tail wheel reluctant. They can fly the Fuji. That's a good fun. Fly with the taxi with the canopy open. That's always really mm. cool. The elbow hanging out. That's cool. So, uh, and then the two day um, industry conference. And uh, we just really like to get more engagement from first job providers and 141, 142 providers um, so that we can sit down and nut something out because it's not going to get any better. No, look, I think it's a fantastic thing what you're doing and especially, like I said, like the uh, the 1st, 2nd of July, bringing the operators together to really swap stories. And, you know, I think I know a lot of it already as I've, I've canvassed so many. Yeah. Um, but just to get us all into the room at one point and really look at some structured um, ways that we can try and feed it down and, and, and part of it was, you know, I just did an EPC recently for an, a, a senior instructor from Perth and it fell through down in Perth, which I think it was a bit of a fortuitous opportunity because it meant he came up to Darwin to do it with me and he got to see firsthand what they're training students for yeah. and what they actually do. And we had thunderstorms, we had rain, we had inters and tempos and everything else on days that typically a flight school wouldn't go flying. Yeah. It was perfectly safe to do so. This is how we do it and it's like, it was just mind opening, and that I think is also another thing we need is to just understand as as well as we can. If you can't get up here, or you can't get to do charter or something else as an instructor, at least have avenues um, to understand what it is that you're trying to produce. Anything will help. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic, mate. Look, it's been a great chat. I know we've uh, both pressed on here with with uh, recovering from colds. Yeah. So thank you very much, mate. But. Uh, Paul, great chat. I think we've we've covered a lot, but like I said, it's we could we could go for weeks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uptconference.com, jump online, check it out. Um, I will be over there as well. Um, so if that's a a, a carrot for you to come and meet me as well, <laughs> feel free. Whatever helps to get people over there, because um, you know I'm spending my own money to get there, because I think it's this sort of thing is so important. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll go from there. Sounds good. Well. I'll buy the first beer, mate. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All right, Paul. Thanks for tonight. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much to Paul for joining me for this episode. A really great chat, doing some fantastic work there. And can I ask you all to get on board and support the event that is happening, like I said, at uprtconference.com. Get on there and register for the two-day uh, seminar on the 1st and 2nd of July. If you are a head of operations or head of flying ops or in an airline environment. It's uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic chat. I will be there and uh, a bunch of others and have some really good open uh, table discussion and see what we can do to feed from the top down and the bottom up and make some change. If you're a private pilot, commercial pilot or anything and you're interested in coming on the 28th, uh, I cannot recommend Rich Stoll enough. He is uh, definitely a guru in the in the area and I'm really looking forward to meeting him and we'll hopefully be having him on the podcast sometime very soon as well. So something to look forward to there. And uh, look, I think we've been talking long enough. Nice big episode. Let me know how you go with it. And if you want to know any other info, anything to do with anything here, it's all in the episode description. Check that out. Links to Paul's websites will be there as well and to the conference. And, of course, links to talk to me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to my patrons. Uh, a bunch of you have come online this week and supported me. There were various memberships. Cannot thank you all enough. And, as I say, all that funds that uh, you, you spend on those memberships goes towards uh, producing all these episodes, YouTube, and uh, doing work in industry as well. So thank you for that. It is all tax deductible. And you can go to patreon.com forward slash flight training australia to find out more all right you beautiful people have a fantastic safe week keep all the uh, interactions coming i will see you next week take care blue skies and remember the golden rule aviate navigate communicate cheers guys